Um, Hello and welcome to this screen talk as part of the Chronic Youth Film Festival. Um, the festival is put together by the Barbican Young Programmers. My name is Ade, I'm a young programmer, and we are here today for a discussion around one of the films in the festival. The film is Q's Barbershop, um, and here to discuss with me is um, Kasim Ahmed, or Q, who is the star of the film and owner of the barbershop in the film. Uh, we also have Peter Kapo, who's a London barber and a consultant on the acclaimed play Barbershop Chronicles. Um, so essentially what we're gonna do here, we're just gonna like have a nice, like a chat about barbers and like all the similarities around um, barbers in London and in, in Denmark, which is where Q's Barbershop is set. And what are the things that resonate across um, across you know, different countries and different, different people essentially. Um, so my first question is for you Q. Um, I wanted to talk to you about um, like, just to give us some background about like how you were approached to take part in the film. Yeah, uh, there was a Danish journalist called uh, Miriam. She just came by. Um, she just came by and uh, saw us at our Q's barber shop. How filled it was! Many people in there discussing about uh, everything, and uh, she thought maybe it was a very uh, nice place to make a serious picture of it. Of our the haircut, the African haircut we're doing, the afros or or the cut, uh, fade or normal cut, it doesn't matter what kind of haircut we had there, and a, diff, a different brothers, <clears throat> and then she took a beautiful pictures of that, and uh, she put it on uh, the newspaper called the Politico, and uh, like she won with the best of pictures in uh, I think it was 2018 on 17 I don't remember, mm -hmm. and she won the best pictures in Denmark, Sweden, and, Den and uh, Denmark and Sweden and Norway, and uh, Europe. And then that that creates some attention. Wow. That creates some attention through the media. And uh, people liked it, that, that the New York look, black young men getting haircut somewhere in Denmark, no one knows about it. And they were very interested to make movie out of it. So there come a couple of freelancers who want to make movie out of it and then and then uh, I clicked with uh, Emil, the guy who made the movie, and his boss. And uh, the, the chemistry was there. The chemistry was there. And I chose them to make the movie. And they promised me they will not show, like, you know, normally uh, where we live, where the media come. They just want to take the negative side of the, mm -hmm. that area. So I made them to promise me that they're going to show the reality there is in this area. They're calling a ghetto. I don't like to call a ghetto, but it's a nice place to live. So, and then they made the movie there. They they choose to record a movie, and I was very glad to say yes to that uh, movie. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, really interesting. And I think you mentioned before that like it took it took how long to make the film? Like uh, is it three three years or? Uh, the movie took maybe two years and six months, but they the the. The movie you saw or everyone saw is the last three months recording they used right. out of it. You see, because the first thing they tried, it didn't work. So it works to just record on the shop, conversation between me and my customers. And that was the best clip they made. And then that's the clips they used to use as a, as a, as a documentary movie. Yeah, that's just, yeah, that's really interesting. That's the last three months. Um, yeah. um, I guess then like, uh, so Peter, I guess for you, the question is, you like you were a, a barber consultant on Barbershop Chronicles, which is like a really successful play in, in London and like around the UK, um, like last year and the year before, I think it was, it was quite like it did a, quite a, a number of shows in the National Theatre. Like how did you come up? Right. How did were you used to that? Oh, yeah. Um, just before, just before I will tell you how I got involved in the Barbershop Chronicles, can I just say that I saw Q's Barbershop and... Um, I don't know. We had a conversation prior. I don't know if I'm allowed to start to, to say this, Adi. Yeah. And I actually thought that um, Kasim is an actor. Can I just <laughs> say that he looked really, really believable. Actually, you no, know, he should be believable because he's an actual barber. But he looked so natural in the, in the movie. When I saw it, I was, I was blown away. Thank yeah, you. Bro. And Thank yeah, you. so let me say, let, yeah, I, I thought I should just put that in. But anyway, how I got involved in the Barbershop Chronicles, um, I could say it came by accident. I work in a busy barbershop. It's um, 
and the busiest is behind the busiest overhead train station in London. Yeah, not underground, but the busiest overhead train station, uh, probably possibly in the whole of Europe. And um, that's arguable. Anyway, the playwright came down to the shop and shadowed us. You know, observed for about forty minutes. He just came in. That's pretty normal. People just walk in, sit down. You do you want a haircut? You ask them, do you want a haircut? And they go like, no, I'm just chilling. That's normal. You know, so when I asked him if he wanted a haircut, he said he was just chilling. I just ignored him. I'm like, okay, yeah, it's a free country and it's a free barber shop. Yeah. So he's, he observed for about 40 minutes. And after that, he just walked up to me and said, you know what? Um, they, I've got a project at hand. I've got a project on mine. And I was just observing and I figured you're the best person to really approach about this project. And I'm like, what is it? And he said, no, I'm doing a play. So initially I thought it was some college thing, you know, like maybe he's in college because he looked young enough anyways. Yeah, so <laughs> I thought maybe he was in secondary school and some school projects that he was doing. And he just said, I just need to take notes and just listen in on your conversations, basically eavesdrop and possibly take notes. I'm like, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, it's okay. So he did that. And if I had anyone in my chair and so he shadowed us, he shadowed us for about, a month so four weeks so it was coming straight fridays and saturdays those were the busiest days so when he would come he would sit behind me and listen to my conversations with my listening on my conversations with my with my customers and more often than not i would even forget that he's there and then if there's anything interesting he would just jump on me go like oh that's really really interesting do you want to say that again do you mind if i record this do you mind if i write it down and nine and a half times out of ten and my customers will go like, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, you can record it. You can take notes and everything. And that's how he cleverly gathered material for the play. And he told me he was traveling around Africa as well. So he was going to five other countries in Africa. And coincidentally, the countries, all the countries that he said he was going to, I've already been. I'm Nigerian originally. I was born in Ghana. I worked in South Africa. I've been to Kenya, I've been to Uganda. So all the countries, when he told me he was traveling there, I was like, oh yeah, I know a bit about this country, I know a bit about that country, and Zimbabwe as well, so I've been to Zimbabwe, you know, yeah. And yeah, so he gathered what he what he wanted to gather at the barbershop, uh, my mm -hmm. barbershop, I worked there, I wish I owned it, I don't own it. I'm like, I'm not like Kasim, Kasim is the boss, I work for someone, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and then he went over those, he went over to those countries and then called me. He made contact about six or seven months after that because he took my number, but I didn't even take his number. And when he called and said, Oh, I'm inward, remember me? The guy that was doing the play and everything, like, Oh, yeah, 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 I remember you. Like, okay, it's all coming good, it's all coming together now. Do you mind coming down to the national theater? So we can just do some auditioning and and you just give us some consultation on how to be a barber and make it more believable. I'm like, oh yeah. And then he said, we'll pay you. I'm like, oh, I was even willing to do it for free. And then you say, you'll pay me? I'm right there. Yeah, so I went in, did about 11 or 12 sessions with them, watch every, and another interesting thing was just hearing my voice because he had a little tape recorder that he was recording my voice and my, our conversations. And I'd even forgotten about it, but just hearing my voice played back to me was really a weird one. Yeah, mm -hmm. and some of the stories, they're like, if anyone has ever seen the Barbershop Chronicles, I would, if anyone hasn't seen it, I would employ them. I would beg them to go and see it if it ever comes out again. Mm -hmm. It's really, really interesting, yeah. So a whole lot, most of the storyline was about me, like what you and Kasim were saying before, before this yeah in the green room basically where about fathers and everything there's a story about my dad yeah that was me my dad and flashlight whoever saying it will remember that you know there was something about flashlight and how parents how our parents are how we were raised and everything that was about me yeah um yeah that's how i got involved actually and since then you actually said it was a successful play in in london but can I just say that the play has taught around Australia, no Canada, problem. USA, yeah, and most of England. So it's not just even yeah. England, most of Great Britain. So it was in um, Scotland, Wales, and the north of England as well, too. Yeah. That's really good. That's very good. Very good. Yeah. Once again, bro.
Yeah, well, congratulations <laughs> to both of you because yeah, you're both like yeah, part of this like really. I think what was really nice about yeah, Barbershop Chronicles and Q's Barbershop is like it spotlight it spotlights like a very small kind of. It seems like such a small part of like like the wider society, but like oh, it's, yeah. it means a lot to the people who are there. Like for me, like going to the barber is quite a big thing, and like so I think it's it's quite nice that those the film and the play are really good at spotlighting um, um yeah. those, that situation for everybody. Um, yeah. I think. Yeah. Just to pick up on, on what you said, Peter, it's like a question for you, for you Q, I guess. Um, so you had like, yeah, the people, the customers who would come to get their trims and their fades and whatever, like, was that like, how did they react to Emil, like coming to record stuff? Was that like, were people like, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to be on camera, like, that's not me. Or was it more like everyone's open to it? Like, how, how was that? How did that play out? It, um, it, it, it might, it might, oh, is, is that for me or for Kasim? Is that for Q or me? Uh, we'll start with Q and then I, I, you can also... Oh, okay. Continue. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, for us, it was a little bit difficult because, like, as I told you before, um, people from the area have the barbershop, they hate the cameras because mm -hmm. every time they made a recording or something, they just show the negative side of that area. Mm -hmm. So it was difficult for me. I employed myself for free to help the camera people, uh, the movie people, to... Mm -hmm. Tell anyone who's gonna come on my barbershop that this guy is who's recording the Q's barbershop movie. They are very kind. They are good people. Huh? Even like like they did with Peter, he was observing also for six months or more. You see, and he had little camera, so he was just recording a small conversation to see and sell it because like in Denmark, the freelancer they have to make a little uh, prototype movie, yeah. like, and then show it to the company they're selling to. Mm -hmm. When he was doing that, also people was not uh, they were not happy with it. So it took me a lot of time to tell my customers, trust me, this guy is Emil. He's a very nice guy. He's come from Made in Copenhagen. He made in, making a movie called Who's Barbershop. Would you please bear with me? Uh, trust me. You know me, right? I'm your barber. Trust me. Are you sure, Q? They always promise, but they never do their promises. Yeah. <laughs> so it was tough for me to tell my customers. Some of them, they went away. They didn't come. Some of them, we gave them, they paid, the movie people paid the haircut because they have to pay my time. Huh? Okay. They paid me for the haircut I'm giving to people. So, and then maybe they started nice and slow to give them uh, yeah, the movie that way. And then a year later, a year half later, everyone get used to it. As Peter said, we were not so talented, bro. It took so long <laughs> time. So we used to the camera. So, yeah. and then they used the last three months of a recording of the movie. Yeah, I guess after t after a while, after time passed, he became more comfortable in front of the camera. Exactly. Just, exactly. Yeah. Everyone in the film is perfectly just. If, if, even my customers, customers now they ask when the Q barbershop number two is coming. <laughs> they want to be part of it. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I'd love to see that. That would be great. I think I'd love to see part two. Um, Peter, yeah. So what you you were saying as well that um, about the customers. Oh yeah, with, with me it wasn't that hard to be fair and. I think I can understand. I've never been to Denmark, but I think I can understand the demographic there because most of the people filming probably were white mm. and all of that. But in my in my case, Inwa Elams is black, originally mm -hmm. from Nigeria, and he didn't yeah. have a camera, so he only had a little recorder. So people tend to be more trusting. And another thing with London is that everybody wants to have their two minutes one minute five minutes of fame or whatever so if they see that there's a camera involved oh you're going to be on tv most people are on board however yeah. there were a few people that actually said no i don't want i don't want my story recorded or whatever and everything but the majority of the people were actually trusting because even even subsequently after the after the play and the BBC actually came and did. Uh, uh, there's been a couple of documentaries that has happened at the shop, and everyone has been willing. And uh, another thing is because they know me as their barber, and they know the other barbers. And if I once I reassure them that okay, no, no, don't worry, there will be no negative stereotype or stereotyping about what we do here and everything, then they're more relaxed and all of that. So, by and large, it was a good reception. To be fair, most of the people that we had were actually willing to participate in it. Yeah. Um, I guess yeah. My next question, then, uh, like, uh, to start with you, Peter. I guess it's like the there was kind of a like one of the big takeaways for me when I watched the film was like was like was the reson the way it resonated with me because of my experiences in the barber. Like, it wasn't it wasn't different at all. It, when I when I watched Q's Barbershop, 
it felt like I was in my barbershop. Um, and you kind of spoken of the fact that you've cut hair in different places. You've cut hair in South Africa, um, um, possibly in Nigeria as well. Um, what do you think, like, what do you think it means for the men um, in the community, like, uh, like the barbershop? What is, what do you think it represents? You know what the barbershop represents. It, it does represent a lot. You know, the barbershop is everything, and the actually possibly that that will be your next question or whatever but i'll probably jump with the gun here but the lockdown the, you know covid19 actually brought it home the essence and the importance of the barbershop when you know when everywhere in england i don't know what happened in in denmark as, as well the same but, but I presume, uh, yeah this is what the same it's only sweden that everything was normal <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah <laughs> it's so, not good. supposedly yeah but yeah but the lockdown actually brought it home and the, so the barbershop basically the barbershop to every man everybody needs a barbershop whether you have hair whether you have an afro whether you're balding or whatever you need a barbershop you know and the barbershop is a place where men over time just just feel relaxed and be you know you know what i mean it is a place where everybody tend to be themselves okay there's a lot of there's a few show-offs though it's a place where people go there and brag as well too you know yeah, yeah. but it's just it's a space like where it's yeah it, <laughs> it, come, it comes to the territory yeah. but yeah so the barbershop to to most to a lot of black men is it just a place to hang out it's a place to share ideas it's a place to talk about sports talk about politics talk about the local yeah the local current affairs what's happening in the neighborhood you know and it's the same everywhere like yeah well what like when, while i was watching cues um barbers w watching the movie and everything I, like i told you I, there's a lot that resonated that, that resonated with me you know i could relate to so much that happened there so it's just yeah it's, it's just a place where people give in and if you come into it into a barber shop and um q kasim i'm sure you can you can um you can concur concur with this you, know, you go into a barber shop you get in there if it's if it's full there's just various there's um, there's a general conversation happening everyone is just talking everyone's talking over over one another yeah. and then yeah, if, and, and if within that in each and every chair you have pockets of conversations as well too so it will be like the barber and his client so there's the big noise happening around and there's <laughs> that small talk happening between you and your conver you, you have the conversation between you and your you and your client and that's when the the deep stuff really come in the intimate stuff that's when they tend to open up to you that's exactly. when the client will tend to open up to you and as a barber and that's another thing that you actually did that they actually portrayed that you actually portrayed in your movie is that as a barber as a good barber actually listening is very very important you know <laughs> so just listening to your clients trying to remember their names trying to remember their stories you know mm. and more often than not they have interesting stories to tell and yeah. like every barber you know like every human being you know you have your favorites you know you have there's some stories that you hear like sometimes i go like oh please not again don't tell me that story i heard it last <laughs> week i had it two weeks ago i had it last month <laughs> do not say that story again you know you can finish it but there's some stories that you just want to you want to you know you want to hear the follow-up you know they tell you something <laughs> now you go like oh two weeks later oh what happened about that and then they'll tell you and then a month later you just want to know how it ends and all of that so it's that's that's the barber shop for you and 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 another thing sorry i, I mean no, i'm probably taking too much time but no, okay. another thing yeah another thing with the barber shop is this cross-generational um, um um integration that we have you know so you could have a man of 80 something years old 90 something years old in there and then you can have find a 60 something year old a 30 something year old a teenager and then you have a little boy like your cute son oh my god can, yeah. I, can I say your son is so 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 gorgeous <laughs> he's so cute you know what i mean and you have that generation and 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 we feed off each other you know one another you know there's always something to learn from everyone even if, you know older people tend to say oh we're wise we've got wisdom and everything but there's a lot they learn from the younger generation because they could come up with a phone and go like, I don't even know how to operate this phone. Or somebody show me, yeah, Peter, can you do this for me? I look at it like, listen, I'm in my 40s, you know, so I'm just the bridge between. And we've got some digital natives here. I could just call a teenager. 
come here, come here. What's going on with this? I could just call an 18 year old. And within <laughs> seconds, he would just sort the phone out or sort his laptop out or sort his iPad out or whatever and everything. And so this is what we learn at the barber shop. It's just a place where people exchange idea, ideas, exchange stories and exchange um, testimonies, basically. Yeah. Um, and I guess to pick up on that, on the point that you made about like people talking about, for example, politics, um, but this is for you, Kasim. I wonder if you wanted to speak a bit about like, so the film kind of touches on it um, a bit with the way Volsmos is perceived by the wider Danish society. And I wanted to like, if you wanted to talk about like, what, like how does that affect like the people in the, in the shop, like your customers and you yourself as well? It affects us a lot. It uh, affects us very a lot because we 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 seen as a we seen ourselves as a as a side society. You see, mm -hmm. because they 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 think they are creating a, a uh, integration and everything, but that's not what they're doing. Because they keep uh, talking of us as a second individual, like non-Danish people, uh, yeah. Arab people, Arab people, Muslim people, this and that, Somali people. I don't know. They just keep on telling us that way. So if I give you a little bit of example, if you or your friends or your family, everyone telling you, you act, you are crazy, right? You go to school, they tell you you're crazy. You go to a restaurant, they tell you you're crazy. You go to your barber, he tell you you're crazy. You go to your dad, your dad, and he's telling you crazy, bro. In the end, you become crazy, right? So all the, the big country, not big, but all Denmark, if they're just telling us, Africans and non-Danish people, or we are not welcome with this and we and that. How can we integrate ourselves? Mm -hmm. So for that sake, so people are like always holding back because we feeling that we are not welcome. We feel that no one wants us. We feeling like we are not part of Danish society. No matter what we do, no matter how high educated we are, no matter how role model, big role model we are, no matter what we do in the society, they always gonna push you away. And that's not the normal people. There is for the politicians who do, who do that because every time they point finger at non Danish, non Danish people, they're gonna get votes from other Danish people because the Danish are very loyal for the politician guys. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are some percentage who are supporting us, who take care of us, who love us as normal human beings, like everyone. But as a country, is the most beautiful, peaceful country in the world. They pay for your education. They pay for your uh, for doctor. You pay, uh, even if you have a high ha heart surgery, is the most expensive thing to do in the world. It's free in Denmark. Mm. Thank God for that. Mm. We take we pay the tax, right? So that's that's why it's free. But the problem is they're just putting in our mind and my kids' mind that they are black, they are Muslim, they are not welcome. So no matter how educated I do them, they will always be defensive. Who's, yeah. What are you gonna say now? Huh? He's gonna tell me I'm black, I'm Muslim. I cannot get a job here, this and that. That's the reason, bro, I opened Q's Barbershop. I don't know if you heard that, uh, I don't know if I can come into that, but what happened was like, I, my, preg my pregnant wife and I moved to Odessa, I moved in in Valosmosa, I could not get a job, all the barbers were Arab, and the Arabs like was a little bit, not all Arab are racist, but some are racist, right? <clears throat> they, they say to Afro men, we cannot can this, cut this kind of hair. We cannot yeah. do this, do that. In the end, one my friend, he went to four places and he could not get a haircut. I get angry and says, and in the end, I told him, "Listen, I want to give him the line up. You tell him you cannot do with a knife. Just give him the haircut." They yes. say we well, cannot do even the haircut. I said, "You tell him you own a shop or you cannot do a fake." So no, we cannot do. It. Show us what you can do. Like they won't put me down, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not a barber yet, but I know how to cut. So I gave him the fucking sorry. That's very okay. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A very good way. And I, I don't line up with a knife, bro. So yeah. they were just like looking at me and say, this guy, oh, you're good, you're good, you're good. And then when I went from there, people telling me to open my, my own, my own, my own, my own. My, where I come from. Somalis are, bro, very weird. Very weird people. Somalis, they look down to barbers. You see? I come from one of, I come from one of the biggest clans in Somalia. So as a clan, I'm not a small one. <laughs> but if I become a barber, my clan gonna after me. <laughs> Tell them why you become a barber? Huh? Can you not find another job? Yeah. I'll tell you, listen. I called my mama. I said, Mama, I want to open barber because there's 2,000 Somalis plus Africans 
who don't have an Afro barber here. Mama, can you give me your, what do you call in English? Your blessing. Yes. Mama, can you give me your blessing so I can open a barber? She told me, baby, none of your brothers or your clan can pay you uh, to, to survive. So what you're going to do is open your barber. The doors, the doors will be open for you. I swear, bro. Since that day till day till today, Q's barber was booming. Yes. Oh man! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, that's a know. lovely story, man. Yeah, so that's why I like want to prove to Danish people, no matter what they do to us, no matter what we cannot get a job or not, or not education, no matter what happened to us, we can survive. All they have to do is that like, believe in us and just stop knocking on us. That's mm -hmm. it. But I don't think they're gonna stop soon. But what we're gonna do is like show them we are good people. We are thankful and we're gonna die for Denmark because we are part of Danish people. Mm -hmm. Our kids are Danish, right? So no matter what we're gonna do, anything we do to do Denmark the best we can, right? But I hope they're gonna come someday that politicians who believe in us not just knocking on us. They're knocking on us since 1995, 95, bro. I came to Denmark. Mm. They were pulling my hair out, they were fighting me. I go to the disco at night, they fight me. Well, no matter what I do, they fight me. Everywhere I go, I fight. Huh? Now I become a father. I hear the politician knocking down on us. So mm -hmm. it's not going to stop. But yeah. what we can do is like at least show them we are better. At least show them we are here to, to, to be part of this community, to do whatever we can to do this community, a better community. Even I'm um, telling them at TEDx, even that we can build a bridge, like bridge between Denmark and Nigeria. Bridge between Denmark and Somalia, bridge between us, Denmark and the Arab countries. Come on, man! Why are you looking at me like a little African guy? You don't know what I can do for you. Maybe I will. I can be the best thing that ever happened in your life. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't know. Open the doors for me first. Get to know me, and then maybe I will be the best person you ever met in your life. Mm -hmm. They don't know, bro. So that's why we have to be the way we are as a barber. My Peter brother, you understand me? Be the most open-minded, open-minded person. To sell the best way to sell, educate the best you can educate, advise the best you can advise, and always be there, be there for them, even when they don't have money. See, so I love to be a barber, bro. I never imagined I could become a barber. Oh, thank you, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Like, I think, I think we have. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kasim said it all. Actually, there's nothing to add to it. But if I might just support what he's saying yeah and it was just just a few tweak here and there anyways it's not really kasim it's not just even the somali um community that look down on bar on barbers or barbering it's just all over even nigeria as well too yeah okay. and it's just a little background about myself is that my parents are academic yeah. you know what i mean so i grew up having private going to good schools and everything and when i said i wanted to be a barber Oh, that's I'm doing barbering. You know, starting from South Africa and everything. There was, yeah, there was a little pushback on that. And it's not yeah. even that, but this is one one thing that COVID nineteen has ever brought to the for, for, forefront is that most of the jobs that we looked as rubbish, you know. So be it a bus driver, be it um, the front worker at a supermarket, wherever and everything, became the most relevant job, you know, when the lockdown happened. So the jobs that we we undermined and underlooked and everything were very, very important. They became key workers. We were in class as key workers, fair enough. Exactly. But even though barbers were in class as key workers, I'm not saying we should have been classed as key workers, but when they had their little, when they had their little um, protest and everything down here, you had placards. People said, I need a haircut. Mm -hmm. People were, washing, were marching yeah. down to parliament to say, I need a haircut. You know, you listen to radio talk, radio, yeah, exactly. On the news, on the news and everything, everyone is just saying, oh, the first thing I'm ever going to do if the lockdown happens is walk down to the barbers. That's how important. You see what I mean? It brought it down to the forefront to see how important it is. And, and in, in as much as the society in Denmark is different to the UK, there's still a lot of similarities, you know. So... Um, one thing, one thing I have to say, first of all, and, and, and among Somalis, I've been dealing with Somalis for, for years, almost uh, about 15 years, all the way from South Africa and everything. Somali people are very formidable people. I know they're very industrious, very, very entre entre entrepreneurial. 
like in South Africa, most of the most of the most of the warehouses and all the wholesale yeah, businesses yeah. were run by Somalis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I came down to England. So I've got a I've got a lot of Somali friends when it's Eid and you know the Muslim festivals, whenever that's when I get busiest. I got a Somali client. Exactly. When if he, if if it comes to me, he's got like seven boys, including himself and his two brothers. That's I'm talking about eleven people. If it comes to me, that that's my appointment council for the rest of the day. I don't take yeah. any anymore. You, you so I mean, yeah, but that's that's by the by. But what I and another thing, one thing that the next project I have in mind, actually, I have a project in mind to say, you know what? Um, it's not original. I nicked it off someone. It just had, it, it would be long for me to go off uh, politics in America or whatever during Obama's time. But I've got a project saying I need to showcase 5,000 black role models. When I say 5,000, mm -hmm. when I say black role models, it, will, it wouldn't be your footballers. I don't care about your footballers or your rappers or whatever and everything. I'm just talking about everyday black people that do everyday job and that earn mm -hmm. an honest living. So I get a lot of professionals come to me. I got doctors, mainly, you know, Somalis, there are a lot of Somalis in the healthcare industry and, mm -hmm. and, and everything. I got doctors, I got lawyers, I got accountants, I got bricklayers, I've got electricians. You know what I mean? People that just do every day's job and earn an honest living. They don't have criminal records. They don't sell yeah. drugs and everything. So if I could just have 30 seconds of just filming them, just telling mm -hmm. their story, just having a conversation about what they do, how do, what they do for work and everything, so that younger generations, you know, if the younger generation can just look up to them and go like, I mean, there's this guy, quick story. He's only 25 years old. When people were going to university and everything, when he finished, he just went and did apprenticeship in a, in, 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 uh, he's an electrician. And now he's only 25 years old and he's on almost on, he's almost, he won, almost any 50,000 pounds. We know university debt or whatever and everything, only 25 years old, you know, but there's so many things that people could do. And we don't hear about this. We don't hear enough of what black people are doing in the media, you know? So it's only if there's a stabbing, Someone gets killed, or someone gets that's where you hear it on the news. Is only how many black youths have died, or whatever. We don't mm -hmm. hear how many black youths have graduated from university. We don't hear how many black youths have, have had first class, how many of them are doing the masters, how many of them are doing the PhD. I've got a lot of PhD students that started mm -hmm. doing the PhD, and now they're all doctors, they have their doctorate in various fields. So there's ample, there's so many, so many, so many black professionals. Like you are there, you're a black professional. But we will hear, you know, when, when things are happening, you, you, but you don't get the interview. You don't get them being interviewed. Like even, I got a lot of scientists, you know, with COVID-19, with the vaccine trying to come out, with all the tests and everything. I've got clients that are scientists, that are working in labs, working hard to do these things. But every time I hear interviews on the telly, is yet again another white person giving the interview, you know what I mean, on the telly. So, the, so basically the face, the faces that we see, the front faces that we see on the telly is non-black faces. So it makes white, it makes other, it makes other white, white counterparts without being, without being um, uh, confrontational, without being, um, yeah, confrontational and throwing a spanner in the works you know i'm just trying to choose my words carefully but what i'm saying what i'm trying to say is that a lot of black people don't come to the forefront to for other white people to see that not every black person is a drug dealer mm -hmm. you know what i mean you know yeah. so not every black person is a wrong end not every black person is in prison you know there are a lot of black people doing 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 great stuff and yeah. even black people get into politics like in your film because there's there's a guy that was in the train and just said he wanted, yeah. To, yeah, he got some racial racial abuse and everything. And then you asked him what he wanted to do, and he said he wanted to be a politician because he wanted to change the stereotype. And that's one thing I try to to do, you know. But when I hear people, when I hear at the shop, people just say, "No, I don't want to vote. This coming election is all rigged or whatever and everything." I'm like, you need to cast your vote. Go register. Them. Just let your voices be heard. If you want to mm -hmm. get into politics, get into politics. If you want to get into the police force, get into the police. You know, because that's an, that's even another thing as well, too, because it's almost like you're a traitor if you're in police or you're in the army or whatever. Most of these jobs that people are going for, just go for it as a black person, because if we have our numbers, the right numbers in there, that's perhaps that's when we'll be able to implement change. Yeah, no, thank you. That was, that was thank really you, great. Thank you. Yeah.
Um, I think that uh, we were going to do audience questions, but I don't think we have enough time for that. So I think. Um, oh, gonna... really? Oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> because you know, I think we've had a really great conversation. So, like, this is, this yeah, is that's good. what happens. Where you, where you speaking to barbers, man? We don't shut <laughs> up. Uh, we <laughs> just <keep Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanted to say, uh, I guess, thank you to to, Cass to Q and Peter for taking part in the discussion. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended, who's watching on I guess, Facebook or, or YouTube. Um, the festival, so the Sonic Film Festival, is still live till Tuesday the 13th. Um, we have three great films on demand uh, on the Barbican platform, including Q's Barbershop. So if you haven't seen it yet, you should definitely watch it and then a series of wonderful short films. Uh, there's also a watch party on, on Sunday the 11th to wrap up the festival so you can see other young programmers apart from just me. So there's, there's a bunch of us um, and we'd love to see you there. So I wanted to say yeah, thank you to, to both of you again. Thank you to everyone who attended. And yeah, I think, I think that's, that's it. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you very much. Nice to meet yeah, you. Everyone. Thanks, Ade. Yeah, bye -bye. yeah. Thanks, Kassi. Nice to meet you, OK? Thank you. Hello, Peter. Nice to meet you, bro. Okay. Take care. Uh, cheers, man. Cheers. Take care. Take care, guys.